So, Messia was somebody I wanted to talk to you about because of the new record also. It starts out with a prepared piano thing and then you move into those chords and right in the, that moment I thought, I, I want to talk to her about Messia uh, because I can really feel <laughs> his influence uh, and I think that's also him talking, right? At, at some point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the third track, he's yeah. he's sampled by Val, exactly, yeah. yeah. Talking about the little bird sketches. Right. So, tickle, you know tickle, how tickle. the birds... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about wh where you kind of uh, heard about him first and what your um, process was of, of learning about his music, studying his music and then incorporating it into your own thing because you take it you take it somewhere else, you know, and you use what you've learned from him. So I'm interested. Yeah, gosh, I'd have to think about when I first heard about Messian. It was so long ago. I remember talking to Benoit Delbec um, about Messian because he always re regretted that Messian was playing around the corner from his house. And he'd try to, you know, he always thought, I'm going to go here, hear him play this week. And and then he passed away and yeah. Benoit didn't get to see him play. So, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I started learning some of his preludes um, yeah. probably about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, people are always kind of messing around with his scales. So that was, there was a little phase there of improvising. Um with some of his modes and, um, and then, but then there's something, I guess I was, oh, I was teaching at the new school and I heard a student playing one of the little bird sketches in the other room. And I right. felt like, oh my gosh, like I have to know what that is. Yeah. So I ran over and the student, I'm like, what is that? And so she gave me the pieces. So I picked up the book and, uh, started working on the, the music and, you know, there's, there's so many, but, um, the little bird sketches were like a little more manageable in mm -hmm. terms of length. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know, just, you know, something always, it spoke to me for, um, specifically, I guess I'm, I'd like to think about, um, you know, sounds in nature, things that can transcend the piano in a sort of more visual way. Um, and so Messian of course does that with the, yeah. with the bird calls, right? These, the bird songs and how does that translate to the piano and um that's something that's always interests me and i use that a lot in my own improvisations and compositions um so it felt very natural to connect those two worlds um and then i'm always interested in like taking those ideas of you know these kind of visual aspects and translating them to the piano and then bringing them back to the tradition the jazz tradition or whatever else I'm working on at the time, if it's classical music. Um, but in this record specifically, it was more about bringing it to the jazz tradition and mm. uh, making it, you know, into something else. So there's, there's the element of tradition. There's an element of that visual aspect, um, connecting nature with the sound of the piano. Um, and then also a lot of R and B, um, hip hop influences and, um, you know, I've always loved R&B, funk music, but it's not something I ever felt like I could really connect directly into my own music. And that was, was kind of a hole for me. So this this project was focused more on, you know, bringing those elements. And I don't know if I actually accomplished it, but, it you know, it was in there <laughs> as an yeah, influence totally. at some I level. Mean, that's, that record, compared to all the other stuff that I heard from you, is totally another step and another another world of its own and uh, it feels very brave uh, when I listen oh. to it it, fe it felt very brave and and very determined and very specific also it just um, it's hard for me to put into words but um, yeah like someone who really knows what you know what you want, and uh, but still you le leave so much space for improvisation and 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 things to happen in the moment. Mm. But also, I thought it was very brave in in the the way you put the band together, taking people from various backgrounds 
and putting them together with this music that is, as you as you just said, inspired by so many different musical worlds. So it's a it's a brave thing on a lot of levels, I think. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, you know, I, I risk taking is like a comfortable space at this point for me. Um, and I think part of that is because it's just part of the process now where I've pretty much made a record every year, at least, uh, or every second year. So I have like quite a few records out as a leader. And I just try to look at them as moments, of documentation of a certain time yeah. period what I was interested at that time, um, you know, how that was coming out in my writing, my playing. And I try not to get too um, focused in on like, oh, this is me. This is my sound. You know, it's really it's really more of that little snapshot of time. Um, so this record is sort of follows in that vein um, where I was, you know, I just met Terry Lynn and I was playing with her, um, playing a lot of Jerry Allen's music um, after yeah. she passed away. And I didn't know Jerry's music uh, very well at all, so it was such a great just experience to be able to learn her tunes. And, yeah. you know, I'm a very visual person, so seeing all the charts and, you know, just digging in, spending hours practicing her tunes. And they're, they're hard. I mean, they yeah. sound like really difficult stuff. How do the, um, the charts look? Uh, well, I don't have... I have a few of Jerry's uh, handwritten charts, but a lot of them, she didn't actually document a lot of those, like uh, archive them. So mm -hmm. um, some of them are transcriptions, some of them are computer charts. Um, I see. Yeah. But yeah. what have you found when you when you took apart her music, learning her music? My gosh, <laughs> there's so much in there. I mean, I did a, a nice transcription of um, of that. Uh, solo piece black man from homecoming i don't know if you know that i don't know that one no yeah check check it out because it, it'll it's a uh, it's it's a pretty incredible piece and you know i couldn't figure out where one was for like two weeks mm. <laughs> like write it down and go like okay and then i'd send it to a few piano uh you know uh piano friends and like does this uh does it seem right yeah <laughs> you know and they they're like, yeah, yeah, I think it's cool, you know. Yep. So um, slowly pieced it together. But, uh, you know, there's just so much. There's, just, She was influenced by so many different people, so many different kinds of music. I yeah. mean, I've been, I've been actually, one thing I have been doing is going back to her tune, Dolphy's Dance, um, yeah. in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I'm just working on it, like two hands, um, playing it in unison. And, you know, it's a really hard, <laughs> hard line. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, and I love, I really love that tune of her, her printmakers. That one has stuck with me. It's like from either her first or second record with Andrew Cyril and Anthony Cox. Oh, I, I don't know that one. And I have to check it out. It's a really, really, really good record. But that tune, there's so many stuff. There's like eight different se sections. There's really eight tunes within, you know, this one tune. Mm. And just incredible, just like from one, you know, jumping lily pad to another of ideas and um i don't know it just that's very cool and, and it's very pianistic you know which is yep. something that i've tried to kind of get away from for many years and so to come back to that was refreshing and it's like okay it's okay to you know <laughs> play chords and think about them as you know scales and and uh you know chord qualities i I don't. I haven't done that in a long time, so huh. it's uh, nice was, to revisit. Was that a deliberate thing um, to 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 move away from that? And how how would you do that? Um, well, maybe it goes back to that idea of of translating things, other sounds found in nature or something visual to the piano. So if i'm if i'm going to play a chord i'm not thinking about it like you know d7 flat 9 you know sharp 11 13 i'm thinking like more about you no know, this is like a you know this is a giant and his footsteps like walking through a garden like how does that sound on the piano yeah <laughs> so it's more it, i spent a lot of time kind of connecting those sort of visual elements and, and, you know, other sounds and translating it to the piano. You know, mm. I think a lot about like when I'm playing a pie, you know, kind of like a music box, like 
what would this sound like, you know, as a, yeah. as a song in, in the music box of my childhood. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time doing that and then translate it, like I said before, just using the, those ideas and um, bringing them back to playing standards. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I've been doing the last, I don't know, 15, 15 years. And, and it's been refreshing to come back and like, read, like I hadn't written chord symbols in a good 15 years. And then for this record, I started writing chord symbols again and yeah. forms yeah. before the blow over. And, you know, it, it felt foreign and weird and, you know, it's, um, risk taking again, even though it's, you know, it's not that complicated. <laughs> Was it something that you thought about? I mean, in terms of, is it okay for me to do this again in a way or? Yeah, I mean, not not if it was okay. Um, it just felt seamless. It was like coming yeah. from a place of experience, and I'm always drawing off of what's happening in that moment uh, musically in terms of, I mean, my own practice and my own um, discovery, but also playing the music of other people. And that's why I've spent so much time still performing as a side person because I get so much from playing others' music and drawing from their work hmm. yeah sometimes I, i mean i talked to my father about um i don't know which piano player it was uh, when we we listened to a piano player who was mainly known for his his leader work hmm. and uh we heard a recording of him being a sideman and my father said um i don't know exactly what he said but he was he was you know something like yeah now we really hear him being in the moment and 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 stretch out for once you know which at that point i was i was that was maybe uh, i don't know almost 20 years ago i was i thought he would stretch out when when i would hearing with his own band you know when, with with his own music but that comment of my father made me think about that and as sometimes I, it reminds me when I'm in a in a sideman position, because you don't have the head the head of the of the leader on. You don't have to worry about making an announcement or talking to the promoter afterwards or, you know, that type of stuff. You know, um, yeah. Is everybody okay? That type of thing. You don't. You just you just come to play, right? Yeah, yeah. I so resonate with what, what you and your father were talking about <laughs> because. It's true, like when you're a leader, you know, you're creating, I mean, especially, and if you're the composer, you're creating the structures, you're putting the people together, it's it's a lot of pressure, um, you know, on that side of things. And there's something about, I guess, because I've just played as a side person for so long, I love trying to figure out, you know, what makes the music, um, what makes it work, and how can I, you know, transcend it and there's for some reason there's just a freedom a license to take it you know where where you want to take it yeah and uh you know and i do feel feel freer in a lot of aspects um i don't know a if, side person. if you know that feeling then if if you're a side person and then the leader might be a little bit insecure or something and asks you for your opinion But you're kind of digging actually being not the guy, you know, being being not the leader at the moment. And you kind of feel like, yeah, I don't I don't kind of want to be in that position right now. Do you know that that feeling? I do, although I can because I am also a leader, I can relate to being on that side, you know, and needing to, needing a little maybe direction or help, um, you know, with the ideas. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to, you know, get yourself into a corner and just start to question it. And sometimes you need people that you trust to say like, no, this school works this way or, you know, oh no, that, that didn't work, you know? Um, so I think it's important to be able to ask your side people and, you know, have that kind of trust. So yeah, <laughs> you can clarify those ideas if you need to. Yeah. So maybe going, going back to the new album, were there moments where, where now in retrospect, you can say, that a specific note by one of the guys in the band was very helpful to you to move 
to bring a piece in a certain other direction than you had envisioned it before. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm putting a group like this together because, you know, there's the there's a composition, but it's really just a framework for improvisation. And so I ask the people, you know, who I want to play with because I want them to bring their view and their ideas to the music, of course, as we all do. Um, so, like, for instance, Terry Lynn, when she plays that groove at the beginning, you know, I didn't have a drum part written out. And I had played this idea, this kind of tune with a few people. And, um, you know, she'd been working out this groove for something else that she was working on and or teaching a student. And then she was like, oh, yeah, let me, you know, try this. And so we spent a little time just like getting it, you know, sorted <laughs> so yeah. we could play together. Um, and I would have, you know, never thought to have ever included that kind of a groove with, you know, with the written material. Yeah. Um, and that happened all the time, you know, on the record, you know, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's about saying something, but more so it's really about the what, the, what the person plays. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, when I listen to your music, um, something is very, very, uh, seems very clear to me when I when I take it in um, and that is uh, that I feel you're making music from a very very egoless standpoint mm. um, not forcing yourself into the foreground into the spotlight but m propelling the music from within and from working together with others um, And I suppose because these things are also sometimes related to our personality, how we are as people. And I, talking to you, I get the feeling that you're similar to that, what I just described <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a human being. But um, yeah, maybe you can reflect a little bit on that and, and tell me how, how you feel on, on um, getting the, the ego in check. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> you know. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know really what, what to say about that so much. Um, I think I'm always questioning, you know, what what it is I'm doing um, and what I'm thinking. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's there's so many. You mean second ideas. guessing or no, not second guessing, but, um, no, just like, you know, what, well, what's the point of having an ego, you know, <laughs> like right. that just doesn't serve you. It doesn't do anything, you know, yeah. and our, our, persp our perspectives change, you know, through the course of our life. And what I thought was super happening or what I was playing, you know, 10 years was super happening. Now you look back and you're like, Oh, that, that was terrible. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I just don't trust perspective at all. It's like, even when I'm listening to a recording, you know, of myself or I'm playing a concert and I'm like, Oh, if this is so bad, like this is not going well. Yeah. And then I listen back and I'm like, Oh, okay actually it was all right you know and, and then the, the reverse happens like i'm sure you <laughs> we've all had this thing yes. happen right where we're like oh we had a killing concert and then we listened to it after and you know it wasn't wasn't that great so yeah. i don't know i just think perspective is like it can't be trusted um and ego lies within that and so i just you know i don't know <laughs> i don't know if that answers the question <laughs> i don't know if, yeah sure Yeah, in a way, it does. But anyways, that was just something that that really that I admire about your, your that your about your playing and how you how you uh, seem to be making music with with others. Well, thanks. I was checking out your trio um, videos before some of the videos. Whoa. You have a lot of videos. It's really <laughs> beautiful music and great playing. But I also felt the same about wow. you, that it was like you know it's just coming from a place of music and wanting to connect with your other bandmates and, and the audience. And I don't know, it's, do you, what are your feelings about ego in the music? Yeah, I think it slows us down in a way, <laughs> you know, when we're, when we're thinking about the ego or, I mean, if the ego is kind of taking over, 
uh, we're so worried about what's what was what already happened and how we feel about it in terms of even judging it if it's good or bad you know sometimes the judging that it's good can also take you out of the moment and you're so involved with ah that was great what i just played or <laughs> what they played with my shit together i don't know you know uh and or i've been i've been reading Eckhart Tolle i don't know if you know Eckhart Tolle the mm. and he's no. okay he's kind of a uh spiritual uh leader or or teacher or something and he's really concerned about being in the moment and how how the ego is always concerned about the the past or the future but never with the moment you know mm. and i found yeah. that it's very connected to how we make music it's either i don't want to sound how shitty i just sounded like or i'm so so concerned with how i will you know what I will play in the bridge because I know the bridge, you know, and I don't know the yeah. intersection so well or something. So you, right. you're not really in the moment, uh, trusting that the moment will present an opportunity for you to take part in the music again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And I think also like, you know, like collectivity of, of playing together with others. Like I love being, you know, I don't, I don't need to solo. I, I like not soloing, you know, yeah. I like just making music and, and, um, you know, that that possibility exists, but it can also just be collective, you know, for yeah. <laughs> the whole concert. So totally. that's one thing about free improvisation, um, and drawing from, you know, from that space that really resonated with me very early on because, you know, there was no expectation of, playing solos or you know oh no that's that's gone you know we're not yeah. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have to include that you know sometimes I felt like you know I, I grew up playing more traditional jazz and bebop and there were sort of these these expectations of things that happened in the music um which you know you you do have to if you want to understand and play that music you, you do have to study it and and understand what those things are um but then you know there was just, I guess, just finding free improvisation in that space was like, oh, wow, you know, we can like break out of the AABA box, you know, yes. we can like um, take it some other places, you know, we can solo, we can not solo, we can decide that on the spot, you know, or not, we can just be improvising the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> not solo. Um, so that just that thinking about that idea of ego, you know, um, I think when you and you engage in that kind of improvisation and, and conversation with other musicians, you know, there's just no ego in it. You're there to help each other and, yeah. and listen to each other. And, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And there are these moments where you kind of, so I, I found that when, when, uh, when these moments where you're kind of, so uh, uh, thinking about how bad you just played or something, and sometimes you decide, okay, there's nothing to gain, to to gain from what I what I'm giving. I just focus on the others, you know. And once I'm doing that, the music gets just so much better because then I'm helping the others and not, you know, thinking so much about me. Um, thinking about how shitty I just played, I just focus on them because there's nothing here. I'll just focus on them, and then you. When I listen back then to those moments, you know, the the the, the, the coolest stuff happens, you know, as, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> compared to those moments where you think, yeah, we're really in the moment, and it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes playing less is the better option. Yeah, <laughs> like you said, listening to the others and playing less. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but um. What I found interesting is uh, because I grew up, um, as you said, also like playing more traditional type of music and, and you know, uh, playing on forms, playing on chords. And then I got interested also in, in, in uh, free improvisation. But f what I found is when I then went back, back and forth, but, you know, back and, and try to to realize that you can use those concepts that you then have learned from the free improv prof world 
to use them on standards or on your own tunes that are, you know, my own tunes, they're, they have chord samples at times and, and, and forms. So to use these, these songs then on, on the trio interplay on, on these type of songs, you know, that was a really freeing thing for me, you know. And I suppose yes. that you, you had a similar uh, um, experience then maybe. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then hearing others do that too, you know, like I love that Paul Blay solo and all the things you are with, with the Sonny Rollins. And, you know, that was like just totally eye opening. You know, he's so melodic, but he follows the melody and not necessarily the chord changes, you know, yeah. if it doesn't, if it doesn't suit the, the phrasing. Um, so that was like revolutionary <laughs> for me. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And just, you know, I think part of it too, like I, um, you know, I, I guess I didn't really have any expectation about the kind of music that I was going to play and I didn't have any outside pressures, um, as a young person, you know, I think like sometimes I meet young people that are, you know, becoming well known or famous for certain things. And I think it's hard for them to break out of, you know, certain ideas about sure, how yeah. they're perceived in the world and then the music that they play and they want to, but they're slightly afraid to do that. And, um, you know, I feel fortunate that I didn't have that and that, you know, I could take risks and, you know, nobody really cared. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> you know, okay, well, I'm just gonna like follow where, you know, my experiences take me and, and this life takes me and, and uh, not be afraid to try to make those things, you know, um, try to make connections, um, in the music and, and also through people, you know, like one of the things I love about playing with Terry Lynn and with and teaching with her is she's just so open-minded about, you know, everything. And, um, I didn't know her really before she reached out like a couple of years ago and mm. it's been really nice to get to know her and, and just her, you know, excitement about opening things up and trying different approaches. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So, you know, that's also part of this is like, what's besides what's possible in the music, like what's possible with the mindset of the people that you're working with and, and how far can you go down the rabbit hole? Mm. Yeah. I was really surprised when I saw on the cover on the, on the record that, that she plays with you and I hadn't put the two of you together. But listening to you guys, uh, it made perfect sense, you know. And but also there's, you can hear that you guys come from different, have different backgrounds, but that creates a kind of a tension. And that's an yeah. exciting tension. Yeah. I mean, I think we do connect over, you know, like, Herbie Hancock and Keith Jarrett were like the two people that I was, I don't know about you, but those were like the two, you know, big influences early on sure. and, and Bill Evans and, you know, Bud Powell. And, um, it just kind of grew from there, but I mean, we share, you know, and I first heard her on that John Schofield record flat out, do you know, that record. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that was my first time, you know, hearing her play and, um, on our record. And, uh, I don't know, just since we've spent so much time together now, there's, there are all these, you know, uh, shared ex influences, um, you know, that we've realized, but then of course, you know, like you said, there's just all these other things. She's very influenced by, by hip hop and, you know, yeah. me by contemporary classical music. And, you know, it's cool to have those shared experiences or the shared, um, ideas, but then also, to be able to draw from these other things and see where that can go. So it's... And hip each other to, to new stuff, right? I mean, I'm sure you've discovered new things through her also. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you, can you name some, some of the uh, stuff that you didn't know before, but got to know through her? Um, well, you know, because I've been teaching at the, um, at Berkeley with Terry at the, um, Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, we have a lot of guest artists. Mm. And so she's, you know, invited Georgia Ann Muldrow, who I didn't know her music at all. Yeah. Um, uh, who else? She had so many people, even Angela Davis and Gina Dent, you know, connecting with them. Mm. Um, you know, just her like kind of 
the people that she's closest with. Last night we had a workshop with Sheila E and Cassandra Wilson. And, you know, these are people that, you know, I love their music, but um, it's been like years and years since I've listened to them. And it was incredible just to like connect in and and hear what they had to say. And, you know, it's um, so, you know, Terry has broadened my world musically, you know, in in so many ways, um, not just through my work, but also, you know, through, through meeting and and learning about you know others music so um it's been it's been very you know special friendship i'm happy for that yeah it's always nice when you hear sounds that you're very familiar with but then in a different context like hearing terry's sound and tony malaby's sound together i i i I don't know if they have played together before somewhere no right and It's so cool that you guys put, you know, I can't stop talking about it, but (laughs) so cool that you put them together. Yeah. And like Esperanza, you know, she was, she's a huge Tony Malaby fan, you know? And so I was like, I have to put these two together, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but like, let's do it. And I was so happy with how that track turned out. The very thing that Michael Atias tuned. Um, I want to check more, check out more of his songs. Oh my gosh. Such a good composer. I'm such a fan of his mm. yeah, really thoughtful musician and, and composer and, you know, also very influenced by the contemporary classical composers. Um, so we, you know, we've, I've known him for many, many years, but I highly recommend checking out his records and mm. you know, Tony's on, on some of them. The original of the very thing, I think Tony's on it. Okay. I can't remember the name of that record, but, um, I'll check yeah, it out. but it's, it's way more, you know, it's, it's super abstract, like <laughs> compared to this, this is more of like turned it into a kind of a pop tune in a way, but. But the chords, are they part of the, of his song or did you incorporate the chords, these harmonies? The chords I had just made up myself. Um, the, the piece is really just dyads with the melody and bass line. Right. Um, so I added the chords in there. Mm. Okay. Another thing that I admire about your playing is um, something that it's not so, not only in the playing but also in the compositions uh, is a sense of clarity. And uh, when I listen to you play anything with with people, uh, the stuff that you come up with is always very clear, and it sets up a very clear vibe. Not. And I don't mean that in some, in in a predictable way or something. Still very very exciting, but super clear. And also with oh, the compositions, you. Uh, you set up a very clear vibe, and specific vibe, a different vibe than obviously the piece before and after. So I'm wondering uh, how did you work, or did you work on on uh, on 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 the clarity aspect of the music? Uh, well, I don't know if this is the reason why it might sound clear, but I, I did write a lot of, and I continue to write, um, etudes for myself. So if I'm trying to work on something, you know, whether it's something physical or, um, you know, harmonic or melodic, um, rhythmic, whatever that is, um, I'll usually write a piece based on that, um idea and go deeply into it to, to provide clarity because I can improvise with it. But, mm. um, I find that writing it down and creating that etude helps to just like you're saying, clarify the idea. Um, and then from there, when I'm improvising, there's always that element to connect into. Mm. Um, so I don't know. Do you, do you write etudes for yourself? Never actually. Um, no, um, maybe I should, <laughs> um, but I <but> never really <laughs> thought about it because, I mean, there are certain etudes that I, I mean, cycles of etudes that I love, like Ligeti or, or uh, Chopin, you know, um, Scriabin, and I don't know if you know this composer called Charles Tournemire. No. He was... Uh, he was uh, one of the teachers of Olivier Messiaen, a great improviser himself. You know, there's some 
okay. some very, very early recordings of him playing the organ. He's written some great etudes, but sometimes with etudes, um, even by the great composers, I have to say that I have sometimes problems with the concept of an etude. Mm. Uh, being the concept of be, uh, an etude being a musical statement because sometimes I can't um, separate the the technical aspect of it from the actual mm. music. Mm. So it so, sometimes sounds like an exercise to me, even with okay. the greatest with the greatest um, composers. I think w if I would spend some more time with them, I would I would maybe get more out of it, but. The, the the composers that I just mentioned, their etudes, I think they transcend uh, to me, just to my, my, my personal standpoint, but to me they transcend the technical aspect or they even disguise it. Like when I think of Chopin's etudes, I sometimes, when I just listen to them, like f lying on a couch, I can't really say what the what the actual exercise in that particular etude might be because it's so disguised. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think that, you know, all the people you mentioned, Chopin, like they're all masters of, of disguising their etudes. But the other thing about that, the other side of that, especially when like when I think about the Giddy's etudes, you know, within the first two bars, you know what the piece is about. You know, there's like That's a true. real clarity to the That's idea. True. And then, you know, it goes, he takes it, you know, to the stratosphere and back. And yeah. Like, you know, I, I have to say, like, I love playing those pieces, but I've only, I can only make it through the first maybe half of like every etude and then, you know, I crash and burn. But, yes. But, you know, the point is to try, right? Um, yes. But, yeah. but that did make an impression on me to, um, clarify the idea and just work from the seed the very first you know the the seed of the piece and develop out from there so whether that's rhythmic or you know even you know I've been taking some lessons with Henry Threadgill and he's also you know talking about these ideas of you know he he um uh, studied Varese's music and yeah. found this way of creating a system to you know invert intervals and um and so he takes, you know, that language and then of sp these specific intervals and chords and, and rotates them. And, and, you know, his pieces are based on on those um, those rotations, you know. So it's like a very specific idea, but then it, you know, bears fruit to this, you know, long, incredible composition. Um, mm. And and you're able to stretch the language um, so that you can, you know, develop something longer and more exploratory but it's always rooted in the basic idea you know the seed of the idea which is very simple and Ligeti has that as well where he's yeah, you know like you know that the fanfares um mm -hmm. uh, etude where he's just playing that thing in the left hand yeah. right those whatever no however many notes going up in one bar one two three exactly. four five six seven eight yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and those accents hitting, you know, on the yeah. offbeats and and then those dyads in the melody in the right hand and then it keeps switching, right? Where the yeah. right hand is playing the line and the dyads are in the left hand and that's that's the piece, that's the seed, you know. It's yeah. a very simple idea, but it's incredibly complicated and, you know, just like you said, it just transcends the idea and becomes this, you know, some otherworldly thing. Yes. Yeah pretty sweet <laughs> absolutely i get dizzy listening to that piece sometimes you know like you get into a trance some somehow did, did you ever try to play it not that one. Oh no actually i did try to play but as you just said i just got to i don't know the first page or something you know and then i was kind of oh shit <laughs> that's <Yeah>. another <laughs> that's another topic of mine i i kind of i lack discipline sometimes and I think that's that might be a reason why I'm because it happens most of the times when I'm writing something, I set myself some kind of limitation or a rule, like a basic musical problem that I'm working on. But then it always takes me somewhere else, like in this conversation. Also, when I think back, I think I asked you something and then you answered something and that took my interest. And then I went there, you know, or 
I'm not thinking like I'm conducting this, but we went there, you know, because then you said something, oh, you know, now you said you're studying with Henry Threadgill. I'm interested in that, although we were talking about clarity, you know. I don't really, I don't really like that kind of steer-headed thing uh, sometimes, um, or or I have trouble being that way, you know. So because I'm always, there's always something that interests me around the corner. So with these pieces, also when I start with the limitation, I might, I might take it for a couple of bars, and then I get another inspiration drawing from that, and I don't want to resist it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've had pieces where I've done a similar thing where I've written something and then I found another, you know, oh, this is really cool. Yeah. You know, let me try to keep. And then I realized, you know, I had written, I just wrote myself into a corner because I had too many ideas in the piece, you know, yeah. eight pages later. It yep. was like, oh, yeah, I should have just stayed with the initial idea and tried to build that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I think it's you know there's different there's a time and a place for everything I mean absolutely yeah in an interview you know it's great I think it's great to follow the flow <laughs> <laughs> do you do you revisit pieces so I mean change them after a couple of years or something when you when you find something new in it no I never do that so I don't think I've ever done that. pieces more or less set in stone uh, compositionally I mean you, you do do something with it when you improvise obviously but yeah yeah I can't imagine because you know it is like a little it's the window into the time frame so if I went back you know five ten years later and changed it I don't know how I would even yeah approach that that would that wouldn't really work for the <laughs> my, my approach I guess mm. <laughs> yeah do you do that Sometimes, yeah. Um, I, I'm very inspired by Wayne Shorter, uh, and uh, I was always amazed by how he would go back to older pieces and kind of rework them, you know, like Angola or Orbits or something, after having played them for so long and, and with different groups. And he, he says, like, a piece is never finished. And I find it really, really hard sometimes to go back to an old piece and say like, okay, I wonder what we find in this old shitty piece of mine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes if you're kind of just not judge it or kind of follow what kind of might, what might ins inspire you from, from that old piece nowadays, and then you look at it from a different, like, I don't know if the, you know the piece Penelope by Wayne Shorter. It's on the... Yeah, yeah, totally. That's the same motive like El Gaucho. And that always blew my mind because I thought like, you know, you write this beautiful piece like Penelope and why would, why on earth would you do something else to it than just this, this lovely thing, you know? Right. And then right. it's just to take it and see that first motive in a totally different zone. Yeah, that's that's cool. Maybe I'll try that. I think part of it is that I don't play old pieces. Like, I think I've only done that maybe once or twice, an old tune, and revisited it. But it kind of, like, lives and, I don't want to say dies on the record. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I recorded it. It was yeah. it was captured in the moment. and um, you know, Welcome I to my I... CD funeral. <laughs> 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 the composition's funeral, <laughs> Life at Jazz Gallery. <laughs> Uh, yeah so yeah no that's a good idea i'm gonna check that out you know i've got the time now so why not you do that i'll write an etude <laughs> <laughs> are you practicing i'm yeah that's a good question but i i um i have a problem with the word practice a little bit okay i have no problem spending time with music for several hours in a row but if my mind says I have to practice something and it feels like work, I have a I have a bit of a problem, you know? And that I think that's connected to what I just said about my discipline also. Because I'm a very I'm not impulsive, but I, I'm following the, the impulses or the, the 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 inspiration and I have to follow this kind of this seeking thing. I don't know. Um and once it, 
kind of a, a routine or or a work thing pops in, I kind of I'm bored or I'm I don't have an a long enough attention span. I think, and that's one of my big problems. You know, I I would like to be more disciplined, but if I like something, and if I'm very interested, I. I spend a lot of time with it and I don't think about the time at all, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I hear you. I was, uh, I just connected in with Fred Hirsch. We had actually never met until last week mm. on one of those like Zoom uh, things at Berkeley. And, and um, you know, he was saying a, a similar thing about practicing, just that he, he kind of hates practicing and he hates the word practice. But, you know, I mean, he spends a lot of time at the piano. Obviously, it's yeah. it's just the idea of, you know, practicing. It's like, you know. I don't know I, why. I, I like practicing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I'm kind of like, you know, I think maybe, you know, I sometimes I just, I'm like, I'm, I'm determined. So in every aspect of my life, I'm like, no, this is going to happen. You know, yeah. I'm going to do this. And from moving to New York, you know, to like just you know, playing like a, you know, five finger exercise or something. So yeah, it's just part of my existence, I guess. Yeah, I would, I like, I would like to have that a little bit more, I think. But somehow I get hung up about the words. I don't know <laughs> why this happens, <laughs> but. Well, I think there's, there's good and bad for both, you know, there's, mm. there's a case to be made for both approaches. Um, like I don't, because sometimes... I don't, I don't feel bad if I don't play piano for three or four days it's fine because I what I do practice is I practice a lot in my head you know working through things and I found that this is actually I can I can be more disciplined in that than to practice the same thing on the piano mm -hmm. you know I love spending time with a classical piece or getting to a sound or, or writing something at the piano or working things out but to have kind of a mechanical thing going at the piano, that's, I've always had a problem with that somehow. But to do that in my head while I'm standing in line at the grocery store or something, you know, or I, I, I did that a lot when my kids were little and I was pushing them in the, in the buggy, you know, through the, through the park and they were sleeping and I was just, you know, practicing a tune in my head, you know, I loved that, you know. Yeah. And you have to find other ways, like, sure. you know, I mean, like you're saying with your kids and, and also now, like, you know, maybe spending time at the piano is not the right thing. You know, I think for a lot of people, yeah, the pandemic is just, you know, they, they don't feel creative, you know, people, there's a kind of a depression and heaviness to all of this, you know, and I don't know, I think, I think there are other ways to feel inspired and, and be creative, you yeah. know, and, when life throws these wrenches and things. It's I true. know with when I, my son was born, I did the same thing, like practicing a tune in my head, <laughs> yeah. walking with the buggy. Yeah. yeah, I totally relate to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I think Horowitz, uh, he, he, was, um, he was working on uh, the fingerings for a certain piano concerto while falling asleep. And when he, you know, taking a nap or something, thinking about these things and your mind gets relaxed and you sort the, those things out more effortlessly in a, in a way. And after the, after the nap, he was able to play the piece in a more relaxed way, you know? Oh, wow. Oh, that's deep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to but try that. Can you tell me how it is to study with uh, Henry Threadgill? Uh, well, I guess, um, I've been going over to his place maybe like four or five times now. Um, and you know, it's just a lot of stories. Um, I just listen pretty much, you know, um, to everything stories from his past to his neighborhood. You know, he lives in the East village and he was, this was before the pandemic was telling me about all the people that used to live in that neighborhood and all the artists and actors, you know, and you just, be surrounded by all these art, great artists and mm. now nobody can afford to live there anymore and have been pushed out. And so there's, you know, fewer and fewer. And, um, you know, he was telling me about living in India and wow. his house there, he would go there, you know, in this, um, in the spring for 
like four or five months out of every year at one point. I think it was like in the 80s. Mm. Um, and then when his daughter was born, he, you know, after she, when she started going to school, they couldn't go um, every year. But he'd have this, you know, he had this huge house and he'd spend, um, he wrote a lot of his, the music for his records there. And, mm. um, you know, the music he's been influenced by that's, he grew up in, you know, in Chicago and this, um, uh, neighborhood uh, with a lot of Serbs and so he was hearing a lot of Serbian music and you know he doesn't like he can't pinpoint something in his music that sounds like Serbian music but you know people who, who are familiar with that music can sometimes call it out he said yeah like, see <laughs> can hear it um, so you know just a lot of stories and then um, he shared a lot of scores and I've gone to a few of his rehearsals with his groups and oh, nice kind of stood, stood over, you know, musician's shoulders and just watched, you know, the process and how he rehearses. And, um, you know, it's really, it's, it's fascinating, you know, and I, I, um, uh, studied classical music for my master's degree, um, at city college. Um, and there was a great class on analysis, you know, of contemporary, uh, you know, post-tonal theory and, mm. Um, so I had a, you know, a little experience, uh, with that kind of analysis and he uses that, as I mentioned, you know, um, for his compositions and drawing that, connecting that to Perez's music. And so anyway, it's just been like totally fascinating to learn about his process and language and, you know, he's gone through a lot of phases and mm. we had a nice, um, for this, for the Institute at Berkeley, we have regular um, interviews each Monday with a different artist, and so we had a nice one with Henry and um, nice. Nicole Mitchell. Yeah, and they were just talking about, you know, the AACM and, um, you know, what it was like when Henry joined, and then how that had changed for Nicole, and, um, you know, their experience. I mean, they just just both of them are such inspirational artists and I have to say that's yeah. one of the like best parts about this job <laughs> it's like it's to hear <laughs> musicians talk you know about their their lives as, as artists so um but yeah it's you know Henry Henry's one of a kind mm -hmm. and he's a great tune titler you know that's mm -hmm. the thing <laughs> yes I love his record titles tune titles yes on YouTube I, there's a there's a great solo set of yours from Buenos Aires that I absolutely loved. I don't know if, really? if you know yeah. that it's on there, but it's on there and you play incredible. Uh, and you, I think you uh, go into evidence and you get, go in and out of evidence. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if you, you must have studied his music because it sounds like, uh, uh, you have a very, very personal approach to it. And that doesn't come by chance or anything that comes through studying it deeply. But then when often you hear Monk's music and you feel like either there's somebody who's playing it safe or somebody who's kind of over-exaggerating the quirkiness of the music, you know, the in parentheses, quirkiness of the music or going like, taking it I don't know you know what I mean you know yeah when somebody I told, yeah. yeah yeah so um when you play monk music and I've only heard you play these two songs but I've listened to that um Aronel version a lot and and today discovering your your uh interpretation of evidence I feel a very very personal approach to it and a very f free freeing approach and I'm, yeah, I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, I love Monk's music, and I have, I think I do have a deep connection with it, just because I've spent so much time with his music, and and in that, maybe it goes to that idea of, you know, when we're talking about etudes, but when you hear Monk's music, it's like clear from the first bar what this tune is about, you know, or within the first, you know, moment and he's gonna he's gonna flesh that out you know and yeah. for me the improvisation is just an extension of that and it's the improvisation is there to to serve the music but there's so many there's the idea the idea monk's ideas are so strong that 
you know, you can use those for improvisation and be as abstract or as concrete as you want to be. And, um, you know, it's, you're still going to know what tune it is. You know, you're still going to know it's monk's music. Yeah. It's evidence or whatever. So, um, you know, I think because of the strength of those tunes and, you know, he just, you can like, he just worked it and reworked it. And like, they're all like these perfect little gems, you know? So because of that, you can extrapolate and do all sorts of things with his music and it's still monk. And, you know, I did a, an arrangement of evidence, a solo version of evidence, um, on my record. I don't know if you heard that record, massive threads, but no. I tried to approach, okay, well, I tried to approach evidence um, as if Morton Feldman was playing it. So it's like a very, very slow, um, and maybe this, maybe I did this on the concert, I don't even remember, but it's, um, you know, evidence is usually kind of played up tempo, right, yeah. with those hits, and um, this was approach was like, you know, super spacious, you know, space, silence, um, just slowly, very slowly going through the form and using more of Morton, Morton Feldman's um, approach to harmony than Monk's in a way. So yeah. it was, you know, not so much, um, you know, fleshing out like an E flat major seven, but thinking more about like where the half steps fall so that, you know, there's one just below the, the top note of the melody. And, you know, Morton Feldman would use these very like tight clusters and then yeah. wide intervals and, so um, it was kind of taking that approach into Monk's music and just seeing if that could work. So again, like, like etudes, just yeah. <laughs> a lot of like taking ideas from other things and, you know. Now to... I want to check that that version out from Massive, Massive Threats, you said, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't heard that record. So uh, because on the on that live thing in Buenos Aires, I think you're playing it. You're playing it in kind of a medium tempo, and at some point you even go into the changes. But you you play some kind of foreign or different harmony before that, but not in a in a super slow uh, tempo. So maybe that's kind of that was a kind of a combination of something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it might have been. I mean, the the roots are the same. The arrangement of, is. Um... Yeah, the roots are there and the melody is there, but everything else is open more to more an intervallic approach to the harmony. So it's not necessarily E flat major seven, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's cool that you um, shed some light on that on that evidence thing because I was I was curious about those chords, you know, if they were written down or if they were kind of if they were coming up in the moment. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember what I would have played, but sometimes, you know, I mean, if it, if it serves the music to play changes and play harmony, the harmony of the tune, then, you know, that's cool. That then that's what will happen. But there's also the possibility of, you know, especially because Monk's melodies are so strong yeah. that you can, you can do anything under it and that melody is going to sing. So mm. Um, I felt like it really worked with the idea of bringing in this kind of visual element um, to the piano. And, you know, I could play like very like, you know, thick, dense chords that I was hearing more as like a visualization of something else. But mm. combined with, you know, Monk's melodies and, you know, it just becomes a, I don't know, it becomes a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But but it can work. They can they can work together and serve each other. Mm. Listening to that solo uh, um, concert, um, there were certain feelings that I already described a little bit in that in that uh, moment where we talked about clarity. Um, and there was one thing which I wanted to talk to you about, which is sticking to one idea and uh, developing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I find uh, in your music quite often, I think, uh, where you seem to be working, and maybe that's coming from the etude idea again, uh, sticking to one idea and developing it. But (laughs) there were certain moments in the solo uh, concert where I was like uh, really following that idea and how you work with that idea and really digging what you're doing with it. And then I... 
there were multiple times when I arrived at the same thought, was uh, which was, wait, how did we get here? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> no, I mean that in the most positive uh, sense. That you take it to somewhere else, but it doesn't feel like, uh, you know, with a sledgehammer or something. It feels like mm. so natural. Oh, okay. okay. These moments were like, <laughs> wow, how did we get here now? But it be but I, I didn't notice a drastic change or something, you know. I didn't know uh, uh, going from here to here so much. It was more like like a wave type of thing. Yeah. I think like some of that comes from my experience playing with Taishan Sori and Ingrid Labrock, that trio Paradoxical Frog. Yeah. And when we would play live, and this was like a real discovery for me, we'd play, you know, a tune, you know, of one of ours, um, especially of Taishan's where it would just stay with this one idea and the tune, it was written out so that the tune would be, it could be as long as it wanted to be. It could be, you know, 10 minutes or 45 minutes. Um, but you were going to stick with the idea. And some of those ideas were very, uh, challenging maybe to the well, to us, definitely, but to the audience as well. Like, Taishan had this piece called Homograph where, you know, you can check it on the recording, but it's, you know, it's just a single note. Bop. And then we get the minor ninth. Bop. <laughs> it's like, but we just stay in that vibe and we play, play these concerts for like, you know, 45 minutes we play that tune. Wow. And the silence became louder than the actual notes you know and the, the the importance of where those notes were placed became extremely important mm. um because there was an idea not to really develop it just to be in the vibe you know mm. but it's it's something like very challenging to try to do that with something so stark you know it's, it's like it's kind of it's simple but it's like slightly oppressive too yeah and i think like you know hearing other people play, you know, maybe in similar ways where, you know, and as in the audience and you kind of go through this cycle of like, like, Oh wow, they're really sticking to this idea. And <laughs> yeah. you know, Oh, this is cool. And then it's like going on you're like, okay, cool. And then like, wow, this is going on way too long, you know? And then <laughs> you get to the like point where it's like, God, I hate this. What are they doing? You know? And then you get to the other side and you're like, damn, they're still doing this. This is like, the, this is amazing. You yeah. Know? It's, the best music I've ever heard. And there's something about going through that experience as an audience member, but also as a player where it made me realize that there's something in that, like pushing up against audience expectation or just human expectation. We don't always have to give in to, you know, what feels right in that moment and satisfy that, you know, yeah. need in that moment. We can push against it. We can push through it. You know, we can become stronger for it. Um, it can be a really compelling performance just by going through that process. Mm. So that's that's what I learned from playing with that trio. And, um, you know, I, I think I carry that with me now when I, you know, no matter what I'm doing. Um, but I don't worry so much about, you know, audience, the expectation, because that idea of pushing up against it is really um, interesting to me. Yeah. How does that translate to your own expectation? Or do you expect something? I just, I guess it goes back to that, like, judgment, you know. That's why I don't trust the judgment. Um, but the pieces, because they're, you know, if they're, if they're improvisations or they're based in a composition or an idea, then, you know, I have the... I have the muscle to be able to say, okay, I'm not going to change this yet. I want to stay in it, you know, and I'm not going to feel pressured by, you know, something in the back of my mind saying like, you got to change, you got to change. This is getting boring, yep. you know, um, because I know from those experiences that can actually lead to some really incredible moments. Mm. Um, but, you know, it took took some time and some experience to, like, to get to that place. So there's always that question, like, even when I'm writing a tune, um, if I'm writing, like, a more through-composed tune with improvisation and written elements kind of blended, you know, how much I want to um, play into that idea of expectation or push against it. 
Mm. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk to you about is, I mean, we talked already about Tony Mallaby a little bit, but I read somewhere that he uh, was also a mentor figure for you. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Can you talk about this relationship a little bit and what you've learned from him or, or learned together even? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I went to the BAMF Center for the Arts in 2000 and he was teaching there. Um, and I was kind of having a hard time. There was, you know, there was a real focus on free improvisation and I didn't have any experience with that. It was really my first encounter with that way of playing. And Tony was like super, you know, first of all, supportive. Um, and, you know, and, and then you could also just see like he was so passionate about the, these ideas, this way of playing. And even though I didn't understand it, there was like real clarity for him about how he was approaching playing a free improvisation. Yeah. Um, so when I moved to New York a year later, you know, I called him up and, you know, he was just that you know, he was really cool. Like, come on, yeah, come on over. Like, let's play, you know, let's like cook and hang out all day. And so we'd go over with a bunch of musicians and we'd play and we'd improvise and talk about how to approach free improvisation. And, you know, he had very clear ideas about what was right and what was wrong, which is wow. weird when you think about free improvisation, right. but yeah. it did help solidify, you know, kind of in my mind, like what I was going towards. Um, improvising but also as a pianist and how to bring some of those other ideas and that's where this whole like ideas of you know visualizing things and bringing it to the instrument that's sort of you know that's where it started I was playing at Tony's house and you know now like that kind of mentorship it's just it's not as common anymore to just be able to go over to a musician's house and, and play and cook and listen to music all day you know it's it's unfortunate but I'm I'm like so grateful that he you know, took me under his wing and, you know, helped, helped to shape some of those ideas. And...